So, you know how I promised that this episode would be all about adding combat to my game? Welp, what if I told you that instead of adding combat, I decided to recode my player controller script, turning my one simple script into 16 different scripts that largely accomplish the same thing, because yeah, that's exactly what happened. Now, before we get into how all of this recoding went down, if you haven't seen any of my previous devlog episodes so far, the game I'm currently building is called It Begins With Mana. It's a 2D side-scrolling RPG heavily inspired by games like MapleStory, but without the MMO elements, which is good because I almost have no game dev experience. In my first three devlog episodes, I went from starting with an empty Unity project, to creating a playable character, to building my game's first map, to most recently introducing my first enemy. There have been a lot of highs and certainly many lows, but so far I've always managed to find a way through the main system I wanted to implement in each episode. However, that almost changed with today's episode. It's funny because it's one of those progress updates where it seems like not a lot has changed when visually seeing the gameplay, but there have been more under the hood changes than any previous episode up to this point. In today's video, we are not only rebuilding the player controller to be a fully fledged, nested, finite state machine, but we are also transitioning to Unity's new input system, and finally implementing animations for climbing up our ropes. Just before we get into the action, I've noticed that just under 15% of my viewers from the last 90 days are actually subscribed to my channel. If you are interested in following along and seeing all of the highs and lows of my game dev journey, I encourage you to subscribe to never miss a new episode, and to also toss the video a like if you are enjoying the content. It really does help our community grow. So I guess the reasonable question that a lot of you will have is what exactly caused me to want to rework so much of my code? And from my understanding, it's actually a very common game dev situation to find yourself in. I was doing research for how I should go about adding combat to my game, the original goal of this episode, by watching some more of Barden's tutorials. In his later tutorials on combat, he himself goes through the process of implementing Unity's new input system and a finite state machine for his player controller, and explains all the benefits of doing so. It was during this explanation that I very quickly lost focus on the initial objectives of my search and began to believe in my heart that my game also needed these upgrades. So that's exactly what we did. Now, reworking a portion of your game is a scary situation because you have the opportunity to break something that was initially working and regress in terms of your total project. Luckily, the world has created systems to help manage these risks. So before we make any major changes to our current project, we are going to talk about Branches and GitHub. Branches are essentially a new version of your project's GitHub repository that exists independently from the main branch. They are often used when working with a team as you can have multiple people working on different parts of your project's codebase simultaneously by having separate branches for each member. For our purposes, we don't have a team, but we are using branches to help isolate our current project from the changes we are making until we are sure they work. That way, if anything ever did get messed up to the point that I could no longer fix it, I could simply give up on the new branch and return to the main branch. Alternatively, if everything that is meant to be changed in the new branch is working well enough, typically as good as or better than the systems in the main branch, it can be merged with the main branch and become part of the main branch itself. So I went through the process of creating a new branch in GitHub and tested that it was in fact working by making some changes and reverting them by swapping between the main and the new branch. There actually isn't a ton of tutorials about GitHub branches specifically for Unity, but I found one from Zanari Nazir that illustrated the basics of the process. It should be noted that branches mostly just manage changes to the project's code, so some changes you make to Unity project settings and assets might need to be reverted manually. I'm not experienced enough with branches to tell you exactly where the cutoff is for things that will be changed back when flipping between branches, but as an example, the project settings we are about to change to use Unity's new input system needed to be changed back manually when swapping between branches that used the new input system and branches that used the old input system. With our new branch set up, we were ready to jump into our first change, Unity's new input system. This was easily the simplest of the three changes being completed into the 
today's video, and to stay consistent, I used Barden's tutorial to help implement the system. As you'll see throughout this video, I use Barden's tutorials for most of the changes highlighted in this episode, and I can't say enough about how much his playlists have helped me throughout this project. The new input system is added by adjusting our Unity project settings, creating a new input actions asset, adding a player input component, and connecting some functions from our new player input handler script to the events in the player input component. Not too bad, but it seems like a lot of additional work to rebuild a system that essentially was already working in our previous player controller script. So what was the point? Well, I'm sure there are many other benefits to using Unity's new input system, but the major benefit that is noticeable right away is that our game now works with both mouse and keyboard, as it did before, but also with gamepad, giving a lot more versatility to how the game can eventually be played. So initially my plan was to implement Unity's new input system and then merge the new branch once our player movement was working and create another new branch to do the next change, our player finite state machine. However, the new input system is only partially implemented at this point as it will be woven into many different scripts of the player finite state machine. So I decided I would also complete the new finite state machine before merging the new branch with our main. After all, I had some experience with finite state machines from our previous episode where we created one for our first enemy, and how long could it really take to implement this one? As it turns out, a really, really long time. This player finite state machine that Bardent is introducing is not the same type of finite state machine that I used for my enemy. We are implementing a nested or hierarchical finite state machine, which essentially is a bunch of finite state machines working together. This was a massive undertaking, and his nested state machine diagram that was introduced at the start of his tutorial was the first time in my game dev journey that I considered turning back because it would be beyond my capabilities. This system was immense, very complicated, and relied on a lot of functions that I had never used before but I decided to give it a shot. I started by following along and implementing exactly the same scripts and states that Bardent was adding in his state machine. A lot of the basic states were universally useful, such as an idle, moving, and jumping state, and the overall structure of having super states for abilities, being grounded, and being in the air made a lot of sense. However, as the tutorial continued, we started getting into states that I didn't need for my game, or states that would need to be adjusted to work with a mechanic in my game. It was at this point that I started picking and choosing portions of the tutorial to implement, and building my own state machine diagram to have a better understanding of what my finished product should look like. I created my nested state machine diagram in Obsidian as it was and will continue to be a living part of this project as I continue to adjust how my player can interact with the game. I had similar super states including ability, grounded, and in air, but whereas Bardent had a touching wall super state, I created a similar touching rope super state to handle how my player would interact with ropes. Stub states were added to each super state grouping where necessary, with green arrows showing how the substates could flow from one to another, and yellow arrows showing how super states interacted with each other. Unlike Bardent's diagram, I didn't include the logic that indicated how each state flowed to another to try and keep the diagram as simple as possible. However, I might need to add this information in the future as necessary. Now, as you can imagine, implementing all of these scripts and states did not always go smoothly. There were many different bugs and issues I faced while trying to either match the results Bardent had in his implementation or, for my own states, recreate the gameplay that I had in my previous player controller script. The most difficult states were definitely the touching rope states as these were my modified versions of Bardent's touching wall states. It took a lot of effort to get these states to a point where they functioned similarly to how our previous player controller interacted with ropes. However, in the end, this iteration of rope climbing came with some benefits, as players can now no longer move horizontally while climbing the rope, which is closer to how I wanted the final gameplay to work. Another state that I added on my own was the drop down ability state. This was to replicate the function of dropping down from one platform to another in our main branch. 
This mechanic actually also works better in this iteration compared to how our original player controller script worked, as you now need to push the jump key and the down key to activate this ability instead of just the down key, which again was closer to my vision for how this ability should work. This whole process took a really long time to implement, probably two to three weeks as I tried to balance it with work and other events happening in my life. It was also an extremely disheartening process, as your player that was so functional is essentially regressing to a level of gameplay that was overcome in the first episode of this devlog. It was really hard to keep pushing through the implementation at the start, where it was unclear if I would even be able to wrap my head around how this nested finite state machine should work. However, now that we are on the other side, and it is mostly working as intended, I can say I'm very happy that I decided to add it. Not only do certain mechanics in my game work better than they originally did, but the scalability of my player controller is significantly improved, which will set us up well for adding combat and class abilities in future episodes. I would also be lying if I didn't say that it was a big confidence boost being able to implement such a complicated system like this. It really made me feel like I can do anything with this game if I take the time to do so. I'm not sure if that'll come back to bite me at some point, but it's how I feel now. Now that we had successfully implemented Unity's new input system and our player finite state machine to a point where they were functioning at or above the level of the systems in our original main branch, it was time to merge this new branch with our main branch. This was again a topic that I didn't find a ton of tutorials about, but I did make use of one tutorial from Dan S, which gave a high level overview of the merging process. I then conducted a quick test merge with another new test branch that just contained an additional comment in the code compared to the main branch to confirm that I had the process down. After the successful test, I went through the same process and merged my full new branch to the main branch, leaving my project whole once again. So with both the new input system and the player finite state machine successfully implemented, I had a choice to make. I could either move forward and begin adding combat, the initial plan for this episode, I could stop the episode here as there was already plenty of progress covered, or I could work on implementing something else from my list of things to eventually fix. I decided to tackle an item on my list of things to fix, as combat was a much bigger task than I had the mental strength for, and I didn't really want to stop the video here when it visually felt like I had changed almost nothing. So I decided to finally implement some new rope climbing animations for my player, because how hard could that really be? As it turns out, very. Now, unlike the last few changes we worked on, this change wasn't reworking anything in our code that we had already built, or at least I didn't think it would be, so we didn't need to go through the process of making a new branch for these changes. Initially, I figured I just needed to make some new animations with the existing rigged asset, but that's when I started realizing how big of a task I'd actually taken on. See, the existing player rig I had only worked for animations where the player was facing the camera. These new animations required the player to be facing away from the camera, which meant I needed a new sprite and a new rig. The new sprite was very easy to put together as I simply adjusted the existing assets to represent the player's back. I then went through the process of rigging the sprite in the same way that we've done previously, adding bones and inverse kinematics. However, once I had the asset ready to animate, I was completely lost as to how I would implement animations with a different rig alongside my existing rig's animations. I searched high and low for tutorials on this, and I really couldn't find any videos that were solving the problem I was having. I found many videos that discussed how to swap sprites on a rig, which will become useful once we start adding armor to our game, but nothing about how to swap between the rigs themselves. Eventually I decided to search in the Unity 2D subreddit, and that is where I started finding people asking for help with the exact same problem I was having. There were many different threads with people asking how to swap rigged assets when the player turns around to climb something. I hit the jackpot. The way this can be done is to create a hierarchy of game objects for your player. You create an empty game object at the top level that contains all of your components except for the player's sprites and rigs. You then add two or more game objects containing separate sets of sprites and rigs underneath the master player game object. Then you use the animator component on the master player game object to create animations using the two game objects that are housing the different sprites and rigs. 
Importantly, your animation should always start by disabling the unwanted game object in the first keyframe, making it so that you are just showing the one set of sprites and rig. For simplicity's sake, I decided to go through all of my existing animations and recreate the animations with the unwanted game object disabled. I'm sure there were other ways around this issue, but I chose the most direct route. In the end, I had all of my existing animations and new animations for holding the rope, climbing the rope, and even a fancy new animation for sliding down the rope. I used an animation blend tree that I learned about in one of Barden's tutorials to do this. However, it looks like the blend tree interface was updated since Barden's video, so I made reference to Bugmaker's more recent video to help complete my blend tree setup. It is a very simple blend tree that plays the climbing animation when the Y velocity is positive and the sliding animation when the Y velocity is negative. I think it really makes sliding down the ropes a lot more fun. With animations added for my rope interactions, I was finally happy to bring this episode to a close. And no, I did not add combat in this episode as I had initially hoped, and really from the outside my game looks almost unchanged compared to the start of the episode, but this is perhaps the most amount of work I have put into my game to date. A lot of the underlying systems in my code have been reworked and are hopefully better equipped for the future. Do I think I'll never have to return and recode a portion of my player controller script again? No, but I believe that the new input system, the finite state machine, and the multi-rig animation system gives me a ton of runway to build the elements of my game that I had always dreamt of building. More than anything, implementing complex systems like this only makes me more confident to take the plunge and try even more complex systems in the future. So I'd call that a big success. As always, thank you for joining me on this journey, and I hope to see you in the next episode. Thanks.